Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Sean and Jax Human of Bone Daddy Bladeworks, makers of the Axis Hand Axe. Now, you've seen the Axis on this channel multiple times, uh, but most memorably uh, when my daughters and I ventured into the woods and I mounted the Axis on an improvised haft, essentially creating an axe from a knife. Now, mind you, we were mere yards from civilization for that expedition. Uh, but if you really, uh, what, what it really did to me was hammer home how useful and how usefully the axis answers the age old question camp knife or camp axe? You know, do I want a big survival blade or do I take an axe with me out in the woods? Well, this answers that question. We're going to talk all about it with Sean and Jax in just a moment, uh, the genesis of the Axis and so much more. But first, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen while you do other stuff. And as always, join us on Patreon where you'll get interview extras, like a little bit extra from this interview, uh, other exclusive content, knife giveaways and more quickest way to get there is to zap the QR code or head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Sean and Jax of Bone Daddy Bladeworks, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Thank you for that introduction. Oh, of course. And, and I want to uh, make a, a special welcome to the youngest ever participant uh, guest on the Knife Junkie podcast, Connor. Welcome to the show. Is he, is he your first baby guest? He, he is indeed the first baby guest. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah, that's, that's an honor that, that comes with, well, bragging rights. Yeah, exactly. I'm, uh, it, He'll carry it with him throughout his entire life, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so you have created this very unique thing, and um, it has featured prominently on the show and on Thursday Night Knives. And I've had a couple of people, one one guy in particular that I'm remembering, uh, who have gotten this after my, um, I don't know, just showing it off. And uh, I, I just think it's really interesting. And I love tomahawks and I love big blades. And I also love thinking about ancient times and how people once lived. So this uh, touched a lot of things at once. Um, well, before we get into the axis itself, on your website, you tell a story about uh, your your earliest memory with knives. I, I want to establish your love of knives and and uh, before we get into the design of this thing. Tell me about that. Yeah, well... Uh passionate knife enthusiast my entire life I, I was really fortunate that you know i think like a, a like a lot of blade collectors and, and blade enthusiasts out there that i had one of those individuals who was just one of those uh you know the 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 quintessential everyman he could do everything he, he was a kind of a just he knew a little bit about everything but he really introduced me to a lot of the outdoor activities that i i enjoy now and love today and that included, of course, arrowhead hunting and specifically knives. That's that's really where my my true passion for knives began because he was a collector of of, of many things, a bit of a hoarder, but he collected really really cool stuff. Uh, he collected guns and knives and silver coins. I mean, just all kinds of really really awesome stuff. And so um, he really was the first person to introduce me uh, to to knives. And this was, of course, at a very very young age. And I got a number of stories where it was probably too young an age that he had introduced me to these knives. But that being said, I, I've survived to adulthood and uh, <laughs> I only did relatively minimal damage to to property and whatnot. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, I've loved knives my entire life. Now, in terms of the genesis of the axis, you actually did kind of hit the nail on the head there. Um, while I've always been passionate, that, that question that you brought up in, in, in the introduction was, always a very, very dominant discussion that I, I noticed occurred on, on forums. 
Um, and it's so, one of those things that people really defend like passionately. I mean, you have, <laughs> yes. you, you have your bushcrafters, right? That that swear by using a big camp knife, and and with that one knife, they can do a, the greater percentage of all their camp tasks. And and they have their way of doing it, and that's fantastic. And then of course. You have your people in the other camp where they have a uh, a hatchet or or a small you know a small camp axe of some sort, and they can do all of their tasks with that with that single given tool, and they of course swear by that. And then you read on these forums, and man, I mean, it was just like one of those really hotly contested debates. And um, you know, I, I mean, of course, I I was collecting axes and knives uh, simultaneously, and I had been designing prior to that. Um, but the axis itself specifically emerged out of kind of that debate. And then of course, that, uh, that prior mentioned, uh, love of arrowheads and, and hunting for, for ancient Neolithic tools that, that came with this, uh, this mentor of mine from, you know, when I was a younger individual, but, uh, at that time there, there wasn't really a good solution to the problem. I, I there were a couple other makers that had, tried to kind of split that difference um and if you do a bit of research you can find them from some of the different people out there um and you know some of them were somewhat effective but they really didn't solve it all around because for the most part it was a a, a head that could be mounted but as a hand tool they rarely were ever they really rarely ever did the job fully um, and so I kind of started from a hand tool up. And, and when you think about it from that way, of course, there was already a solution that existed and this existed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years ago in just the, you know, the hand axe, a very, very simple and primitive tool, but one tool that uh, in and of itself, you could do almost anything with. And, and early man was doing incredible amounts with this. I mean, we, you know, we, we're surviving with these primitive tools and, and it, obviously we're still here. So we must, must've been doing something right. And must've been thriving to some capacity. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a long roundabout answer to your question. Maybe. No, 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 it's not. We're going to get actually way deeper into it, but uh, the, the whole idea of the knife being the first tool, I believe that uh People, all sorts of people, um, have an inherent fascination with knives. You just pull out a nice knife around almost anyone, and they're going to notice. Jax, is this something that you've always uh, been interested in as well, or is this something that has uh, grown with uh, with uh, your relationship with well, Sean? Funny. Well, I mean, it's grown with him. But funny enough, um, my dad just handed back to me my first pocket knife, oh. and Sean has a similar origin story with knives where he took his one of his favorite or an early pocket knife to his mom's car the car seat specifically yeah you know, just yeah like um i i took my pocket knife to my my dresser top and my mom was not very thrilled with me about that yeah. <laughs> that's where it started and uh that never really stopped after that so yeah i i have a not may, maybe not quite as as intense a passion but it certainly attracted me to my husband so Yes. Well, what what do you think it is uh, about knives and about the knife that is uh, that draws people to it? It's nice having a really good tool to do the job when you need it done. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a I used to be a pastry chef, and it it's your your knives in your kitchen are, are really really critical. But you need to have a nice sharp knife if you want to get your job done. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to be wasting so much time. So you take the time before you start to make sure that it's honed properly. And if it's not, then you got to go home and you got to sharpen it. And you waste so much time in the kitchen. And that's even though I, I was actually an axe type person when I would go camping, but mm -hmm. knives were always. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so but I, I knew the importance of a good knife. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, it's it's interesting. I could see how you would make that that separation. You know, when I'm in the kitchen, I'm using this very refined, very thin, sharp, fully flat ground blade. But when I'm out in the, you know, when I'm out at camp, I'm going to use this big chunky ax. It, it kind of, I could see how you would want to make that distinction because knives to you are these, uh, you know, tools of precision. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So. I did always bring a, a little kitchen knife whenever I would go camping, but my dad always said, bring, bring an ax with you. You never know if you're going to need it. So that, that was what I brought. 
Well, so I, uh, as I mentioned before, I had this for a few weeks. Well, I had this for about uh, a month before I had a chance to go out and experiment with it. And in that time, I watched your video of how, you know, of your demonstration, of course. And I have the packaging. I, I don't have it right next to me. I, I should have. I should have uh, brought it, had it right here with me because I love the way this thing is packaged and I love how it comes with a carabiner and tight and uh, 550 cord and other things that you would need. You could just take this right out into the wilderness. It's got a Kydex sheath and everything. And uh, so the idea is, and I, I believe this is you in a, in a, uh, in a, in a more her suit day, right? And, <laughs> that, um, that's right. That is me. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> Perfect. And and all you have is this in your pack. You go out with just this, and you can use this in a um, you know sort of levered way here to chop down a small tree, and then you can mount this on the small tree, and you have an axe. Uh, so that is the whole uh, unique selling proposition of this thing. And uh, I keep calling it a thing because I don't want to call it a knife or an axe. It's an axis. It's both. Like uh, I see it. I see it as an extreme tanto blade. Sometimes I see it as nux sometimes. And I know that's not, it, you know, in in the design, but it's there. Um, it's got so many different ways to hold it and use it. Um, so how long did it take you to settle on this design? How did you know, because you're you're talking about arrowhead hunting to me like that immediately sparked the thought like uh, these Paleolithic tools meant for a lot of different things. A spearhead is a knife. You know, when you have it on a short half, it's a spear when it's on a long one. If you put it at 90 degrees, it's a war hammer or whatever. You know, how did you go about making this and designing this in this particular design? It was that is actually the result of uh, a number of different iterations. This one, I think, was probably the the fifth in the line. I, I had been developing a design over a, a bit of time. It was one of those ones where it's like inspiration had struck, but it, it wasn't clear. You know, it was it took some time for it to marinate, for lack of a, a better description. And so I actually had worked with another knife maker. Uh, his name is Dylan Farnham. His company is Sage Blades, and he he is just a, a really outstanding bladesmith, kind of all around. Um, really, really talented, but he actually helped me to kind of create some of the first few models and they were really, really rough. I mean, they don't necessarily look like the axis, but I was testing out some of these different concepts, the little bits and pieces of the puzzle that were kind of trickling in through time. And, and then what the axis is, is kind of the culmination of all those pieces as I was starting to see like, ah, yes, this worked, that didn't work. And while the axis you know, when you look at it just in your hand, it doesn't have any handle scales. There's no pins. There's nothing to it. It seems very simple, but to actually end up there wasn't, wasn't actually, you know, the, the engineering behind it, it, it did actually take me a long time just to kind of solve everything and kind of wrap, wrap my head around all the different things and make sure that at the end of the day, once I had solved those issues, that it was still a tool that you could hold in your hand, you know, whether you were barehanded or had a glove on, and that it could be comfortable and actually usable um, as a knife. Because like I was saying earlier in the show, you know, that was one of the main drawbacks of any of the other um, knife axe tools that had been made before is that even if they went to make a, a reasonably good uh, axe head, they they just, they just always left something to be desired as, as a, a knife and or a hand tool. Mm -hmm. And this of course is just, it's, you know, Really, I, I mean, I I think I probably more often use it as a hand tool, really, than than an axe, just because it is so versatile with that skeletonized frame and all the grip options that it that it offers. Uh, I I want to point out a couple of design features that uh, that uh, you point out, but also when I saw them, I thought uh, I don't know. I just it's very intuitive to me. I I really got it when I saw it. But uh, this little flange, we'll call it, or trigger. And we call that the Ford, that's the forward facing trigger. Yeah. The forward. Okay. So this forward facing trigger and then this choil, this uh, acts sort of like a, a blade, you know, guard finger choil you'd see on a traditional knife. Uh, but between these two uh, positions, that's where you get uh, this stability when you, cause the potential for a design like this to go awry <laughs> is huge, especially when it's mounted, uh, you know, uh, in maybe even in a state of desperation 
on a haft because you're not going to have this sort of stabilization in this direction. This whole thing here uh, totally gets rid of that. You're, you're, you know, all you have to do is find a sapling uh, with with a tapering width that will reach that point, cut it off a little bit up here, and then you can really wedge it in there mm -hmm. and get it so that before you even tie it down, which you absolutely must do before you use it as an ax, but even before you tie it down, you have stabilization. Exactly. Uh, it, it seems like a lot went into figuring just that out. It, it, it is. And that was exactly the engineering that I was referring to. You know, it, it when you're holding it there in your hand, it, it looks so simple, but really there is, there was a lot that really went into actually coming up with that concept and getting it all to work. And again, like I said, making it so that it was still comfortable in hand. You know, there was a bunch of different thresholds that I had to cross, but those that forward facing trigger and what we call the rear facing trigger, that opposite counter mm -hmm. choil and that plane, what was really kind of, that was a, a little bit of the linchpin, that, those triggers, because what I realized is even though the wedge at the very center of the tool where it mounts is reduced in thickness. You'll notice if you look at it from the side, mm -hmm. it, it is reduced from three eighths inch thickness down to a quarter inch at the top. And then actually all the way down to almost one eighth inch down there at the belly, exactly. Um, and so that wedge, you know, really helps fit into the split of the wood as you're pushing it down. But those triggers themselves are the full thickness of the material. So they're still three eighths inch thick. Uh, and, okay. and as a result, that means when you have it mounted, there's literally no way for it for the tool to push through the slit in the wood because it's those those triggers are thicker of course than the split even if the split happens to extend down past where those triggers are resting right. on, on the wood it it still is much thicker than that split and so it, it really can't slide out furthermore what you know the uh, the tool was designed to you be used with paracord as how you lash it and when you've wedged it down in there and you tie paracord really tightly around it, I, I actually, I can show you this here. Um, this is one I've had mounted up for months and months and months, but it was wedged down and you can see the triggers are resting right over the split there. Mm -hmm. And you can see how wide the split is up here. Now, when I really tightly lashed this uh, axis down into the split, um, it was already really, really tight. And then I started chopping and any energy that gets, um, you know, transferred into the tool and ultimately goes towards working it up at all is actually stretching the paracord tighter and tighter and tighter as it's oh. trying to, if it tries to slide up or push out, the paracord is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So in essence, the more you chop with this, if you've done a really, really good hafting job, um, the tighter it, it will, in fact, actually get in there. Now, this one, I did have to go back and re-tighten after a couple of months because I did chop it down fresh, and I recommend you do chop mm -hmm. down a fresh sapling, uh, you know, scrub tree or something like that. Obviously, nothing, no hardwood, nothing, you know, that is a desirable piece of wood. Um, but what the reason I had to go back and retie it is as the wood dries out and you lose moisture from the wood, it, of course, shrinks. And at that point, then that can loosen it up over time. But for a couple of days, if you have a really good half job, which this one was, it should be rock solid, you know, if, uh, as long as you keep checking, making sure that how you have it actually tied off at the end hasn't come loose or anything like that. Okay, so so you decide on uh, the idea, you hone the design after many iterations, and um, Jax, I'm assuming that you play heavily into the business side of things um, in with Bone Daddy Bladeworks. So once you had, well, tell me a little bit about, about the history. Uh, uh, Sean, I know that you were a realtor at one point, and I know just from reading your bio on your webpage that at, at one point, uh, the two of you just decided to, to, to light out for the territories and, and uh, lived remotely and, and really put this mission um, on the front burner. Um, Jax, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, we met in Austin and it, the access was actually one of the first topics that came up when we first met. Naturally. <laughs> Naturally, of course, right? <laughs> and um, not a bad thing, it's a good thing. No, right? no, it's um, a good thing. But, but uh, yeah, so I knew what I was getting myself into and then we decided we had had enough of Austin. The city was changing, it was getting bigger. And so we thought, you know, let's out into the woods and so we got out there and i wasn't thrilled with the job that i had at the time i, I have a marketing background 
And I mean, not that it was a bad job, but it was a bad fit. And so I wanted to, I wanted to help him fulfill his dream. So yeah. Um, yeah. I told him, you know, you do this, you do your end of the bargain. I'll set up the company, build us a website, get us on Kickstarter and help run your social media. And I'll do all the legwork, like the accounting and all that kind of stuff. Wow. And, she she she's the technical genius kind of behind the operation i mean the reason yeah. this whole thing happens at all is because of her efforts I, I have i have no computer skills i i am by contrast technologically illiterate yeah. so this is uh you know we were really it was a match made in heaven and i had had the idea long before i met her but i never had the ability to really put it into action until i met her and so it was uh, uh, that's that's really beautiful gorgeous. yeah you know, that's uh, those those are the kind of creative relationships. I mean, I happen to be in one right now with Jim, <laughs> the producer of this show. I mean, like uh, those are creative relationships that are so valuable when when people um, can offer their strengths, you know, and those strengths are complementary and they and they add to and create a mission. Um, as as we can see, Sean, you're a bit of a caveman. You're hacking away at a tree and and here Jax is over here starting the whole business man that's yeah. that's pretty awesome i know what a, what a great deal right <laughs> like oh man my job is i have to go out and i have to play in the woods and you know she has to sit here at the computer it's, it's tough it's tough for you man. <laughs> so so then how does it work with the your tell me a little bit about your design process and then take us into manufacturing and i will uh i'll, I'll preface this by saying on your on your website, you have a, just a teaser of a shop from a sketchbook. And I love, you know, uh, I love looking, snooping through people's sketchbooks and it's a, it's a picture of an old, you know, drawing, yeah. uh, an old, uh, design of this. Uh, so tell me about how you design knives, um, obviously by hand, cause you said you're computer illiterate, but yeah, yeah, I, just, I, was gonna, I was gonna lead with that. Yeah. Like I, I, I am definitely not, the type to draw it on uh, on CAD or, or uh, any of those types of programs. I, I spent some time actually trying to learn, and then it was just it, I, it was clear that that was an entire waste of my time because I just it it would have my company would have gone out of business by the time I had even begun to figure <laughs> it out. Um, so no, I draw. I have some graph paper um, that has one inch squares broken down into eighths. Uh, so it at least gives me a really, you know, a good basic background for for getting my my base my basic flow and and geometries right. But it's all just hand sketches on paper, uh, and then you know progressive iterations of that. I'll I'll take scans of that and then you go mean, over you it. You mean I'll take scans of it? Oh, you'll take scans of yeah. it. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the team scans and and then <laughs> yeah, and, and do printouts and then you know do line drawings over that just to try to refine it. But uh, yeah, it's pretty rudimentary. It, you kind of are accurate. It's kind of caveman style. Right? <laughs> you know. um, well, how does that get, how do they get built? Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, it's a fairly extensive process all the way from, of course, you know, starting out with just a raw sheet of steel. Uh, in this case, we had used D2. We're, we were, of course, considering some other materials and, it's a long story getting to the other materials, but this first batch was made overseas and we had come up with this entire concept, discovered our entire pipeline, had the entire business model and everything prepped. And this was um, the year before COVID happened, I guess, or a year and a half before COVID really set in. And we were scheduled to launch um, in Febru February, February 20th, 2020. Yeah, yeah February 20th, 2020 which we did on the 20th of February. And um, and then it was just like two weeks later that news of COVID broke and then the whole world kind of shut down or soon thereafter. I mean, it, yeah. was, it was right at that time. But uh, the reason I, I say this is we had, for the entire time that we've been setting up the company, we have been operating under the pretense that international relationships would be good. International manufacturing would still be a thing that would take us into the future. and. Mm -hmm. You know, we would be able to utilize those relationships to get the best value and, and ultimately the best product because a lot of the partners that we were sourcing or rather all the partners that we had sourced were really high-end manufacturers and people that were working with a lot of other big companies 
Um, and so we had been on a wait list already for a long time. This is even before COVID had started, just because they were in high demand. Then COVID hit, and all of a sudden, just in an instant, you know, everything that we had worked so hard to kind of that entire pipeline that we thought was so secure and and which had been for so many people for years and years and years before, it was just in an instant, kind of suddenly it was like having the rug pulled out from underneath us. So it wasn't that like our manufacturer had shut down, but they were dealing with the same struggles that we were dealing with here. And, you know, everybody was kind of getting shut down. And um, we were just a couple weeks into our, I don't know, four or six week campaign, something like that. We were doing a month long campaign. I, I can't remember exactly how long our, our Kickstarter campaign was, but we were just a couple of weeks into it. And all of a sudden we were facing this, this, reality that's like oh man you know so do we pull the plug like how do we how do we handle this now that you know it seems like everybody's in this state of kind of chaos and disarray and and we didn't we ultimately chose not to pull the plug um and i'm obviously very happy that we didn't yeah. uh, because the demand still stayed high and we still managed to far surpass what our our funding goals were um but it was it was really 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 scary and we really had to ask a lot of our backers because now getting back to how these are manufactured um that process ended up taking almost 2 years which you know we had originally budgeted for a matter of months not 2 years mm. Yeah. Uh, and we actually added cushion onto that estimate exactly. because we, of course, every, something goes wrong with manufacturing, but we weren't expecting that. No, we yeah. weren't <laughs> expecting this. And so, you know, I, I could describe to you the specific process of how they're manufactured, but that's honestly, I think a little bit less relevant than, you know, the, the struggle that we actually had to go through to, um, readjust after you know we still we stuck to our original plan and we did continue to work with the manufacturer that we had because we had already contractually obligated ourselves to them mm -hmm. and they were still 100 percent behind the project you know they just needed time like everybody else to try to get things back up and running again and um so we got our initial batch from them and they were they're great it's it's the axis that you see there um you know so they were they were on point and, and they really did hit the mark but we realized that if we wanted to continue to grow and succeed at a company, we, we really, we couldn't keep functioning this way and waiting two years and, mm -hmm. you know, putting our, the success of our company at the mercy of other partners who may have our best interest at heart, but at the end of the day, they, it still took the control away from us, you know, and that COVID really brought that into, into stark contrast for us. And so, in terms of manufacturing, following the completion of our Kickstarter campaign, once we had filled all orders, we we really, and even before that, actually, we had started spending a huge amount of time looking for uh, new manufacturing solutions here in the States, uh, because we suddenly realized, you know, if we were going to move forward with this, regardless of what played out internationally and how the relationship continued to progress through time with any country, it didn't matter. If we wanted to be able to have control of, of our product, then we needed to actually be involved in the manufacturing process and, and, and or at least be able to oversee it and visit. And so with that in mind, that really, we learned a really important lesson and it definitely, it cost us, you know, time, it cost us momentum as a company because waiting two years for product is, is never a good thing for anybody. Of course, now we have a ton of product, but, you know, it took us a long time to get there. and and keeping your, your customers satisfied while they wait for something that they purchased as long as two years ago is, is no, it's no small feat. And so we have now spent all this time transitioning our entire pipeline over and have basically at this point committed to fully manufacturing all of our future products here stateside. Wow. That's, that's awesome. It, it, um, is, it is. We're, we're still working the kinks out of this pipeline, but We've had to be very, very intelligent and had to rethink some of our designs, some of the processes that were involved in the manufacturing process on those axes. We had to figure out how could we get them done here since a lot of the same manufacturing techniques that were you know, used overseas are not necessarily as big and or as common here in the States. And you know, that's one of the things that I think as a country we are currently working on. We're, we're trying to get back to a place where we really have a, a firm grasp on our own manufacturing, but you know, it's it's going to take time. And that was a challenge I initially ran into as I was trying to talk with various manufacturers, just 
everybody had the same idea as me. Everybody wanted to get back to bringing manufacturing back to the States, but mm-hmm. they, all your, your manufacturers were swamped. And, uh, you know, trying to get anything done here at this point, then suddenly your your timetables were astronomical because they weren't really equipped for the kind of capacity and the demand that they were suddenly getting. Um, that being said, we are now in the process of actually also developing um, I, the shop that we, we are working with. It's actually it's, it's a somewhat of a family business. Not that I would be going into this business, but my dad works in in in. in, in industrial air pollution control and so he actually works in machining already and had a machine shop um now it wasn't particularly equipped for blades and that's why i uh, bring up the point that we had to kind of rethink some of our processes a little bit because um his shop wasn't necessarily exactly what we needed um but in doing so and kind of uh, in challenging ourselves to figure out how we could make these things work with what we had at our disposal i think we've actually ended up with uh, kind of a better product. And it's also because of some of these changes that we've made, allowing us to consider some materials that we weren't able to consider before. Mm-hmm. So there, there's, you know, there's like that old expression, when a, when a door closes, a window opens. And this has definitely been one of those circumstances where I'm very excited about, you know, the future prospects. It's, it's definitely been a lot of work to suddenly change that manufacturing pipeline over when we were just in, just in like the budding stage of our company, you know? And so yeah. it's, it's been a thing, but I think the long-term gain for it and the return for it is, is going to be much better for us. I mean, that is a very common struggle that I hear all the time from, uh, from designers and makers who are just trying to bring their designs to a, a broad audience or yeah. makers who are trying to make their work more available than their custom work will allow, you know? And, um, it is very difficult to do it here in the States. It's difficult for uh, the OEMs in the States to, to make it worth their while off their while oftentimes. Uh, I, I do see here something um, uh, that could be promising on that end, and that is that there's uh, there's no um, there's no mechanism to it. So it might be a simpler build. It might be something that that uh, you, you know is, is an easier thing to manufacture over here. Uh, frankly, but but something that I think is so cool and interesting about this is that, uh, you know, I knew that that this was D2 and I knew it was uh, overseas manufactured. Um, and and to me, what that means is it was created with the like just uh, premium machines and premium pr- processes, uh, like the most modern and up to date. And yet the way this came out, it's so cool. It's it really does look um, kind of a napped or chiseled out of something, you know, it really does have an ancient look uh, with a modern utility to it. Uh, and I know it was made on really modern machines, but designed with cavemen in mind. I like all of the different, uh, you know, kind of contrast with this thing. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, I that that napped look, I mean, that is a bit of a excess. It, it really doesn't provide necessarily any, any functional use, but, I, I think it gets pointed for the coolness factor. And, and it was also uh, trying to honor the, the tools that inspired it, which were flint hand axes, you know, which were, of course, napped tools. And that's, that is definitely what inspired that texturing that you see there. I would argue that it does have utility in that it reduces the surface area that whatever you're, you're chopping this through is coming in contact with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. What do you think? It's, it's so, a good point. It's a good point. When when you were launching, I mean, in the worst time, uh, you know, in American yeah, business yeah, since yeah. the depression, um, yeah. in a way, you kind of lucked into what something that uh, this this podcast uh, uh, witnessed, and many other people, uh, uh, manufacturers and knife makers, and uh, there was a there was a knife rush because so many people were at home and and uh, some a lot of people had disposable uh, cash uh, you know at times and yeah. people were bummed and uh, the world might end might as well get uh, some knives you know uh, spend that money well so, but people because they were I'm sorry to interrupt you there but no, no. also because they were locked in people were thinking well gosh I can't do anything but play in my backyard or go for a hike or whatever yeah. and so that was the other thing that I was really you know we were surprised by, but because I, I think the entire outdoor industry, by and large, actually did quite well through that time, and at, we were also subject to that, just like you pointed out. But yeah, that's that 
was definitely a, a, a unexpected gift because we were really we were sweating bullets when when it all started breaking down. We you know we were we actually had lost a lot of backers and support initially when the news first broke. But as as the reality started to set in, and we of course had a long enough campaign that people did have time to kind of start to adjust and, and accept what was going on. And then of course that mentality did start to set in that like, Oh man, I guess I'll get outside. What else am I going to do? Right. And I think that definitely worked to our advantage. How do you, um, what's your elevator pitch for this, uh, for the bone daddy blade works axis hand axe. And I'm saying the whole name because I keep calling it this thing. And uh, some, sometimes when I hear myself, I'm like, yeah, that, that, I don't mean that to sound like, hey, this thing, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a term of endearment. It is a big chunk of metal uh, that is uh, very appealing to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, thoughts? I mean, easiest kind of like a one, one line pitch for you, I guess, would be um, the... Uh, the, the chopping power of an axe and the utility of a knife from a tool that fits in the palm of your hand, really. Oh, nice. You know, it's, it's pretty basic, you know? So I think that there is a great... I think you you could take advantage of the... Um, uh, well, frankly, the prepper market. Uh, not even prepper. I shouldn't even say that. Everyone, everyone among us, everyone with ears who hears right now, <laughs> should have a get home bag in their car. They should have a, a go bag in their front closet and, and all of that. And to me, this thing is a, like just a, a dream for that because you really do have both of those. Um, you know, that and a Swiss Army knife, uh, you you could cover so many bases. A lot of bases. You in really a survival could. situation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And funny that you mentioned that. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of our backers, when, when, sorry, she, I'm going to, yeah, she, she might have to stop. <laughs> well, Jax, if I don't see you, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's oh, been my hard. pleasure. Bye, Connor. <laughs> um, a lot of our backers, when they would reach out to, to talk to us about, uh, about the access and tell us how they plan to use it. That's actually exactly what they would describe their intended use was for, for the tools. They were going to keep it in their truck or in their, in their bug out bag. And, uh, and also actually we got, um, a lot of first responders, uh, firefighters, mm -hmm. people like that. People, uh, some, we actually had some individuals who were involved working like the fires in California, the big fires that, uh, you know, were raging out there last year. Um, some of those individuals had reached out to us and, you know, could appreciate the utility of it because they're in a really kind of awful, dangerous, harsh environment. And the, the idea with the access was, you know, you're so many of the, these tools that you carry into the bush with you have so much, so much weight. And if, if you're trying to carry an ax and a big knife, the additional weight could be multiple pounds, especially considering what type of initial tools you were carrying. Um, but for these types of individuals, they, they really appreciated the fact that even though the access itself is, you know, only about 14 ounces, you had the potential to make it into a multiple pound tool, a much, much bigger batter chopping implement than it, it, it initially would seem. And that's really useful for people who are trying to move quickly in the bush or who are trying to keep their pack weight down and or pack size down. Uh, and yeah, and so I think you right you are right. Preppers and or people who are who are really focused on the the utilitarian and the, and the space savings, the weight savings, those types of individuals, I think, are really where the access will find its greatest appeal. Yeah, and, and any sort of survival kit, this would be welcome in. I, I got to say, uh, but as uh, you know, Jim had the videos up. First of all, your videos are pretty great. I love them. Uh, <laughs> But uh, as, as you could see, you know, one shot after another, one shot, you're hacking away at a tree full force with this at the end of a haft. Uh, the next shot is uh, Jack's cutting meat. Um, those are two different, very different purposes. What kind of challenges did you come up against when designing the, the geometry, you know, coming up with this edge and uh, those angles? Yeah, well, you know, obviously I had my two primary challenges, which is the tool has to function as a hand ax. And so in order to get that axial rotation and have everything occur and lined up, there's that belly edge, that primary belly edge or the bottom edge, rather, depending on kind of how you're looking at it. 
Um, but that had to meet the wood in a, in a precise fashion so that it would obviously do the intended job. Um, and then conversely, once the axis is hafted up, I also needed to have the angle of that front edge be such that when you're chopping, it's conducive to uh, handled chopping. And so that really drove that that front end shape that you described kind of like a, a, a jumbo tanto. I mean, it does, yeah. it looks a little bit like a, a just a, a monstrously huge tanto, but uh, I, mean, I guess that's, it's kind of a good description really, you know, functionally that's the same. Yeah. And, the, and you, it makes sense that this slightly, uh, well, this curved and slightly inward um, uh, uh, front edge here is the perfect angle once it's on a haft and moving on a hinged uh, axis like that. It's mm -hmm. perfect for making contact, full bellied contact. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And even, you know, there are multiple grips for hand axing. There is, there's the traditional kind of four finger grip, which provides a, a lot of security and, or like what you're doing right there, that's the, that's the three finger grip. Oh, and no. you can, you can really get, you see how you have one finger forward, your trigger finger forward of the trigger and yeah. then the other two behind it, you can get a, a lot more axial rotation if you're comfortable. I think I would tell users work up to that type of chopping technique because it's almost a loose grip. I'm not actually really holding it super tight. It's, it's a bit loose in my hand and I'm letting that, that twist, you know, that's, yeah. that's really where you get that edge velocity from uh, and why it, it performs so massively well, considering how short it is. You don't normally think a tool that is that teeny could actually do it, but it's because of, of that axial rotation and, and how it translates into that edge velocity. Yeah, that's how uh, in the video I was talking about before. You know, I'm just I'm just seeing the lanyard hole. Not that there aren't a million holes on this thing, but I'm just seeing the lanyard hole now. And I should have uh, had a lanyard, you know, kind of wrapped around the back of my hand just uh, when I was doing this. But uh, yeah, as you may have seen in the video uh, that I put, I did put up a couple, but one of them, um, uh, the sapling that I ended up using. Uh, as the haft for this, I just, it was like one or two swipes, you know, I just kind of bent it, got a lot of tension there and just, it went right through. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just using it like this. Now I, I must say uh, when I first got this, uh, I was coming out of winter. I was a little softer. didn't have the calluses so much. Uh, I needed gloves for this. Um, yeah. Now, now I'm, you know, I'm a harder man. I'm a tougher man. And, and I'm not sure if, uh, uh, like right now, it's not uncomfortable at all. Uh, okay, when I good. first got it, it was uh, I needed the uh, the leather work gloves felt more a little, comfortable. A little bit of heat, yeah. There's there are those edges there on the shoulders, um, or what we call the shoulders, and that's where the metal is reduced there on on the mounting wedge, but it still mm -hmm. is left thick to either side. And those those edges are kind of the, the primary point of contention when people have talked about hot edges, and you know, and I, I can definitely sympathize with that, but we we do leave those there. It with intention because as you have probably noticed when you did actually haft it up those shoulders are also responsible for really holding the axis in place because they actually bite into the wood they are why they are wider than the wedge mm -hmm. and so leaving them sharp or you know they a little bit hot uh, as I, I like to describe it leaving a little bit of heat on those edges just makes it bite better. And we have had versions where we, you know, we took it down, but then you actually get a, you know, a little bit more kind of side through it. It really actually helps those shoulders just to really bite and sink into the wood. Well, uh, a role of uh, all ancient tools uh, was as weapon. And I know that's not how you market this at all. Uh, but of course, uh, just my lens that I look at things through, of course, I had to pick it up like this and, Think, man alive, uh, you know, if you punch someone with this, uh, this this could also be a really nasty sort of weapon. Uh, yeah. if, uh, but I mean, you know, at this point, you I, can say I that can't about really it. comment on that. You know what? That's that's uh, I, I would suggest that people would try not to use it. as yeah, a weapon. Yeah, yeah. I can certainly say that in the design. I mean, if you hold it in that position and like put it flat on the table, you will notice it kind of jacks your wrist at an unusual it, it doesn't impact the, the weight distribution wouldn't be such that it would impact evenly. Yeah. Yeah. So I would fear, I mean, yes, it could do a lot of damage to somebody else, but it would probably do just as much damage to the user themselves if they tried, you know, what that's I mean? the, that's the, the overall problem with brass knuckles that I have found. I've never found yeah. a comfortable pair 
that have yeah. that hasn't jacked up the hand. Uh, but you know, uh, I gotta say, the mall ninja in me, the twelve year old boy in me, is like, oh, I could hold it like this. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, on the site, you have uh, and and in your um, really cool packaging. I'm I'm bummed I didn't bring it with me, or you know, it's in the other room. But you have at least ten and growing handholds. What? How do you see the different ways of holding this? As uh, uh, you know. Uh, y y 10 handholds are they doing 10 different things and uh, how does that add to to the usefulness of this it's it's funny because i i spent months just racking my brain trying to come up with all the different ways that you could use the access all the ways you could hold it um, all the functions that it would be useful for in the woods and i had these massive lists of all these functions and the reason i had done that is is obviously because i was trying to come up with my shot list and think about the best way to, to demonstrate you know the show the tool off to to the best degree um and after the video after i was all done i thought i had come up with everything people were reaching out to me left and right and and showing me other ways that i could use the tool and they're like oh man why didn't you show people doing this or you know or that it's like I, I honestly have no clue and it simply boils down to my lack of knowledge as a, as a bushman myself i mean there are there's limits to to what i know and what i can imagine um, and so those those tin handholds, you know, I was really just trying to figure out all the different ways that I could actually interact with the tool, you know, myself. That I, I can't necessarily speak for the functions of all those tin handholds because honestly, there's there really are too many, you know, in, in a yeah. Please interject. This uh, this number four on the top, four from the left. Okay, so that's what I have right now, and that's that's uh, how you sharpen a pencil with the axis by the yeah, way that's you a hold, primary goal right there you hold yeah. it like that and sh 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 sh. that's one of the I, honest to god i have a i have a giant uh and varied knife collection but what do i do mostly with my knives but sharpen pencils well there's there's few things in life as important as a sharpened pencil you know that that is true not only that but but being able to sharpen a pencil also means that you can make feather sticks if if need be also also true and that was that was you were I, the story I was just telling you. That was the thing. I was like, why didn't somebody immediately ask me? Why did you try to make a feather stick? Or oh. <laughs> why didn't you? Well, specifically, it was though. Why didn't you just hammer the axis into a, a log and then pull a feather oh. stick back on it? Draw. And I, yeah, of course. Why? Why didn't I do that? I, I can't tell you why I didn't do it, but it's one of the most effective ways of actually making a feather stick with the axis. Do you, um, what's your social media? Um, I know you were saying, uh, before that Jax is, uh, Jax does your social media and, and I know that you make really good videos, uh, but what's your social media, YouTube, uh, Instagram presence. Uh, you mean like our, our following our followers? No, I mean like, uh, like how do you use it? Because it, it seems like, uh, you know, you could have a, a contest, uh, the different ways people use this uh, because it's a, such a varied kind of, you know, such a, a versatile, I'm sorry, tool. You, you've posed that question. And some of those responses that, I, that I've mentioned came back when we reached out to the group, it, not just on social media, but we also developed a really close relationship with our backers on Instagram and Indiegogo. We, we worked really, really hard to stay in touch with them because like I said, it took a long time to get them their products. So we, yeah. we yeah. wanted them to know that, Hey, we're here. We're, we haven't forgotten about you. We're still thinking about, you know, what, what you asked for and trying to get it to it. Yeah. Um, and so we were regularly updating them and, and asking those types of questions and getting that type of feedback. Of course, the access was already in production, but if I were to shoot the video again now, I, I would definitely incorporate more of that at this point. Um, I'm sorry, is that, I may not have been answering your question exactly. No, I, it wasn't exactly a question. I was just, uh, I was just thinking, you know, since that person, uh, and I had the same thought about the feather sticks. Like, yeah, uh, I bet I bet a lot of people have come up with many different things uh, that you didn't even dream of. Uh, they, they, they absolutely have. They absolutely have. And in fields that I hadn't necessarily even imagined either. Oh, you mean fields of like occupations and such? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, it's it's funny, but the the firefighter one actually did really take me by surprise a little bit. Not that I, you don't obviously associate acts and acts with um, a chopping down wood or anything like that, or, or just having to chop in general. But, you know, the idea that they were going to take this tool and, and use it, um, you know, rely on it in a, in a heavy capacity in a, in a situation that 
kind of really meant so much, that really kind of hit home for me because I'd always imagine it, you know, the happy bushcrafter out going into the woods or whatnot. And that definitely, I don't know, it upped the ante. It, it, uh, it was a pat on the back and, and it also, you know, it definitely makes it all the more important that yeah, as I am designing these tools to, to really make sure that, that the engineering's there because these, a lot of these people are either there or somebody else's life can theoretically be on the line, you know, so that, it's really important to consider those types of things. That's interesting. It's like you, you, you get, you know, you're thinking of that uh, theoretically all along, you know, that's a huge part of the, the process, but then someone fills the order and is like, yeah. I, and by the way, I'm taking these into harm's way. I hope they work. You're like, yeah, police officers, soldiers, I, you know, it's, it's, it definitely brings it home, makes it, makes it real, for lack of a better definition. You know, I don't, I don't know. And it you also know, gives it meaning. It does. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. Well, you, you know, you definitely feel like you're out. I, I personally feel like it, I am contributing to something, something more, you know, if a person's really willing to stake their survival on, you know, my tool, that's really what higher compliment can be paid uh, yeah. a knife maker, you know? So I know you just, uh, um, just weathered uh, the, the pandemic business uh, climate and you got, you finally got your all of your axes in and you're uh, filling orders and 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 all of that but you're a creative person i know you must have something cooking up uh like the kind of ideas you're thinking of what are, what are the kind of things you're thinking of i'm not putting you on the hot hot seat for what's your next design but uh, uh, like this is a this is a very meta idea sorry to use that expression but it, it is and and i'm wondering what your next kind of idea or or thought is uh, absolutely I, I um I, I can only get so far into it actually because we're still actually working on the process of, of getting it patent so I, I can't really hold it up to show you yet mm -hmm. um but the the project and design that I'm actually working on now in my opinion I would say makes the access look like child's play um <laughs> yes. yeah which I mean not to like diminish my own tool because I, I'm very fond of the access obviously but just how much I've learned since then and, and getting back to that idea of, of trying to be a little bit more innovative in order to make my, my U S pipeline work. Um, I, I ultimately have developed a tool, which we are, we are calling the bunker buster. And I like to call it an, an entrenching tool because it is going to replace the hand shovel. It's a, um, a full size uh, knife, which you can use for batoning. It can then be mounted to a universal haft, which is entirely compatible with the axis and all future hand axe designs that we're going to release. Um, and it can, I, I, like I said, it can mount onto this haft to make a full size shovel. Um, but unlike the axis, which can only mount really on one axis, this tool that I'm developing, the Bunker Buster, can actually mount along three different axes. So it can be a shovel from the front, an axe once it's mounted this way. But it can also be mounted this way, so it can be used as a hoe or a pick or a pry bar, you know, things of that nature. Um, but I, of course, that's where getting back to the name, the name Bunker Buster comes from, and uh, the idea of an entrenching tool. Um, one of the main challenges that we face with the Axis is shipping a bladed tool internationally is an absolute nightmare. They have very, very strict. Every country has their own rules and regulations about blade length and size and dimensions. And even though the axis is, we classify it as a camping and gardening tool. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not a combat tool. Oh, we had never intended it to be that way. And we worked very hard to market it so that it didn't come across that way. Um, but, you know, customs agents don't know what they're necessarily looking at. And, and if you add up the front edge and the belly edge, it's, a, it's a lot of blade there. Um, and so having a sharpened edge on a tool and trying to ship internationally, especially after COVID has become so exceptionally challenging that that also drove a little bit of my thinking in terms of designing this next tool. And one thing I noticed, we are not allowed to market on Facebook. We're not allowed to really play videos like on Instagram and we can have our page, but what we can actually, the ways that we can actually market the access are really limited. Uh, and so the amount of eyes that we've actually gotten the access in front of is a really small group of people because it's it's actually kind of hard to to blast a tool like this, uh, especially considering the way it looks and people's preconceived notion that it looks like a knuckle duster, you know, you like you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so one thing I did notice though, is on those platforms, those social media platforms, those uh, camping shovels, nobody has any problem marketing those guys. You know, they, they have those ones that have the folding heads and yeah. uh, they, they sell them smashing cinder blocks and all this stuff. And they're, they are interesting tools. I, I, I don't actually have necessarily one of those, um, but they're interesting enough tools. I, for me, they, they lack something in terms of um, some elegance and, and the opportunity for some functionality, especially the fact that the head on most of those is not removable and usable as a hand tool again. And so again, with that basic premise, the Bunker Buster is a fully functional hand tool, knife, traditional, just kind of what you would expect a bush tool to be, but it has a really, really unusual design and, and some very, very unusual geometry because of um, the, the need for it to also have strength along certain axes so that it could be used as a hoe, you know, broad, hafted for digging and or shoveling and or axing you know there's just there was a lot of asks on the tool hmm. um and what we finally have come up with it it doesn't look like anything i, I mean I, I really i can't compare it to anything because it, it doesn't look like anything else again like the axis here it is wholly kind of unique and in a league of its own um but we have already got to the point where we've gotten a a steel prototype and we actually are, are looking at um, nitro V which is a, a steel that we can source here incredibly high corrosion resistance incredibly tough um, but it also because it is basically a stainless steel it it frees us up from having to do the titanium nitride coatings or some of these additional steps which are driving costs and com complexity of manufacturing here in the states so we're basically, we're considering using a super steel for that one. And of course, heat treat is going to be very important because it's going, it has to be both an impact tool, but also has to have enough hardness that it can maintain edge and, and do some of these other things. That's, that's uh, the thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, but th that's the thing that, uh, that immediately uh, makes me think uh, is, is that you're going to be using this like a hoe or a shovel. So it's going into the ground and I've learned the hard way about what happens when blades go into the ground, you know, when they hit stone. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be walking a, a fine line because yeah, because you need that edge to be hard enough to be a cutting edge for a knife, but you also mm -hmm. need it to be tough enough to take the impact when. It... Absolutely. Ab and... you, you're not wrong. That is the challenge. And the heat treat, like I said, is absolutely essential on this. Yeah. Now, what I will tell you is to, in order to be able to market it fully as a shovel and also for it to be able to endure those kind of impacts that you're talking about, we aren't taking it down to a razor's edge. Of course, a user can yeah, get this tool sure. and they can put a razor's edge on, on any of the exposed edges that they like. But it, I, I like to reference, um, it was the, the cold steel, uh, like Spetsnaz the shovel. Spetsnaz, yeah. Yeah. Which I, until I got one of those, I never realized how insanely useful a good shovel is. I mean, how much work you can do with a good shovel. And that that tool at its price, I mean, is it's just an awesome all around tool. I, I really, I really enjoyed using it. But I also noticed it was really incredible that I could use it for chopping down trees or tearing up earth or digging up rocks. And yes, you do. You do hit rocks. You do get dings. And that's why they don't put a razor's edge on that. Right. You know, I mean, it, it will happen. It, it's inevitable, especially if, if this tool gets used the way that it's intended to be used. But I will also tell you that like the Axis, it has um, that that Tanto kind of concept, except it's actually three-sided. Now, the third side is a, is a false edge. That side is for batoning. But the reason I, I pointed out that it has three distinct sides is the front edge, the one that would be used primarily as the shovel edge and or your, your primary ax edge, uh, your, your your edge that's most likely impact rocks. That one specifically, I I probably won't keep that one razor sharp. And even my my own personal use axis, I don't really necessarily keep it razor sharp because I find after a few seconds of chopping, a razor's edge goes away pretty dang quick, especially if you're really abusing a tool. And the amount of impact that you deliver with this is still more than a person chopping with a big knife I, you know it, it's just the addition of this lever arm and the translation of energy to this front edge is so much more and so i don't care how sharp this thing is at, at when you start off with 
after chopping through some hardwood for an hour, it's, you know, it's going to eat away at your edge. And so I, I personally subscribe to the school of thought that I, I don't need to keep my ax razor sharp. I, mm-hmm, I, I yeah. like to keep my, my pocket knife razor sharp. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. You're, you're fighting tomahawk. You keep razor sharp, but, but not your axes or not, not your tool. Uh, the, by the way, so I think the bunker buster sounds like a tool, uh, it sounds like a relief workers tool, like something that you could produce and send uh, to places where the hurricanes just hit or Absolutely. or what have you, because it, because it could be used for so many different things. I, I really like the idea of taking the the hand tool, but but creating one that that is equally useful in hand as it is mounted. Uh, Sean, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thank you. And uh, I, I think this uh, axis is really cool and a great innovation. And and the irony is that it's it's an innovation, but it's an ancient, ancient concept. <laughs> so uh, that's that's a cool thing, too. It's like that they say everything old becomes new again, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, thanks again to you and to Jax. And of course, your bouncing baby boy, Connor. It was a pleasure yeah. to have you all on the show. Thank you. It was great coming on. Thanks a lot for having us. My pleasure. Take care, sir. Thank you. Do you carry multiple knives? Then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. You know me, I was coming uh, coming into my, my tomahawk phases. I, I have a bunch of them right here next to me. And this one is by far uh, one of the most unique and useful. Well, it's not really a tomahawk. We just... You, you heard the whole conversation, but um, I love me some hafted tools and uh, you just have to check out the Bone Daddy Blade Works axis and uh, see what it can do for you in a survival situation. All right. He did not pay me for that, uh, nor should he, because uh, that was an awful ad, but love the Bone Daddy Blade Works axis. All right. Check in with us uh, next Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental Thursday night for Thursday Night Knives live here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And of course, uh, join us next Sunday for another great interview. All right. Uh, Until next time, I'm Bob DeMarco saying for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, please don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.